The Floor Academy podcast is sponsored by Trelama, the trade labor marketplace, where businesses can find skilled trade labor, such as flooring installers, and where flooring installers and other skilled tradespeople can find permanent or project work. You can set up your profile at trelama.com, T-R-A-L-A-M-A.com, or download the app from the Apple App Store or Google Play. And remember, Trelama is always free for skilled tradespeople. Welcome to the Floor Academy podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Hadeen, owner of Illustrious Hardwoods in sunny Phoenix, Arizona. We're here talking with flooring professionals from all over the country about the issues that matter to you. I want to encourage you to learn while you earn. This week's guest is Eduardo Martinez. Eduardo owns and operates Martinez Commercial Flooring Services out of Fort Worth, Texas. Growing up, Eduardo learned the trade from his father. Eventually, he went out to start his own thing and has grown it from working locally to traveling the country to keep his ever-growing crew busy. Listen in as we talk about how a business is as unique as the individual that runs it and how that helps separate you in the market. Eduardo Martinez. Are you sitting next to me? Yes, sir. We are sitting next to each other. This is weird. I don't know what to do because I'm still going to put phone ringing sounds. No, definitely add it and <laughs> just make sure that we you know, follow those guidelines of phone. <laughs> um, welcome to Phoenix. Thanks, sir. Nice to meet you in person. Thank you. I've been, I've been trying to catch you, but I'm always in and out of town really quick. So, Well, you, you work nights too. You got to do the day thing. Yeah, right now it's you know almost 6 p.m. and it's my, my breakfast time and is when I wake up, so... Good night, people. And I'm ready to go to bed. I worked all day. I'm done. (laughs) I got a delivery to do after this. So we're going to go do that. Um, Let the folks know who you are, what you do, why you do it. All right. So my name is Eduardo Martinez. I'm the co-owner of Martinez Commercial Flooring Services. I partner with my wife who does all the office work and, you know, keeping me on track to, you know, stay on board our our, our plan for our business because I'm always out here having a good time, as I put it, uh, working. Um. I, I, I do mainly commercial retail right now and we're doing commercial retail groceries, but you know, we didn't, we landed on it by, you know, great luck, great fortune that we're doing what we're doing, but I've been doing commercial my whole life. I've never actually really done any residential. So and anytime I have somebody that asks me if I can do residential, I got to say no. <laughs> you know? that, it's okay. I'm the exact opposite. Oh, you want me to do that grocery store or something? I, I don't know how to do it. You got to call somebody else. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's just a different, you know, it's 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 sports, let's put it like that, you know, but we're playing baseball or football or, you know, lacrosse or it's, you know, you guys are playing golf in residential and, and you got to have a, you know, football team to to run commercial. Absolutely. So. Yeah. So, I you start out under your dad, you start out on your own. Well, for the last 6 years I worked under my dad. Um little by little, you know, he started getting uh, injuries here and there and started and not being able to do the work as much. So I started taking more and more of the project management side. It's kind of what I grew up to do. And all I knew really growing up was just commercial projects. But we didn't always, we weren't always at retail. We were doing, I remember doing schools growing up. Like I remember being like six years old and mom was making tacos in the cafeteria late at night. Cause, um, <laughs> you know, at the time we couldn't afford a hotel. So we would stay over at the night at the, at the jobs overnight. So but that was a long, long time ago. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. You got to make it work, right? You know? Yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, one man trying to do a school was, is, is, you know, monumental for him, but it's just, he had a very strong drive and now I appreciate it greatly. I love the guy now, but growing up, it really sucked <laughs> having to go to work every <laughs> summer or the weekends, and, you know, and, and now I'm like, you know what, this is, this isn't too bad. <laughs> I can only hope my son turns around because you ask him now. There's there's video evidence on on flooring installers of America, and you can. Hey kid, you want to install flooring with your dad? No, I hate flooring. <laughs> All right, man. When you need money, you let me know. Yeah, that's pretty much what happened. I needed money, and then I started doing it, and that's where my first few attempts failed. Because uh, this isn't the first time I opened up my business, and it's not the first time. You know, I failed about two to three times before. Um, but it's because I had the wrong vision of the work and I had, uh, you know, I made mistakes along the mm-hmm. way. Obviously we all do, but 
now I've, I've taken those lessons and learned that it's okay to make mistakes. You just got to improve on it and just get better and better every time. Yeah, definitely. You got to, you definitely have to screw up. Absolutely. Otherwise you're not going to learn anything. I mean, you can try and absorb all the information, right? That's why the show exists. If we can cut some mistakes out for people, that's great. You're still going to make some mistakes on your own and you have to learn from them. If you're not learning and then you're going to do it again and again, and it's definitely going to bite you in the butt. Yeah. And that's definitely where the specialization comes in where like we, we ended up with a partner who was like needed somebody to do a certain type of work. And that's exactly what we were doing, but you know, we just needed to, you know, and, and grow our, our business to meet up to those demands. Mm-hmm. And so I opened up, me and my wife opened up our business in March of 2020 or February, but pretty much right before the pandemic started. And I was really, you're good. You, no, keep going. Just, you can't bang on the table. Oh, it's just, it helps me. <laughs> I know <laughs> you can hear it though. Okay. Sorry. I'll just do this. Um, yeah, we started the right before the pandemic. So we were, I mean, we were really optimistic. We had just come back from the FCICA conference. I had won the Bruce Nubro uh, SIM scholarship. I got to hang out with some like the coolest guys, contractors. And I came back from that convention with, you know, very optimistic hearing that contractors need us, you know, skilled, you know, professional quality installers. And it made, it was a good feeling to me because I came back with like, Hey, that's me and I can provide that work. They Mm -hmm. need me. I don't have to come out here begging for them. So that's how I went into 2020. Obviously we all remember what happened. Uh, how we were benched after that <laughs> so brand new business i think i started with 500 bucks my dad's van a trailer and some tools and you know so I mean, we just spent all summer playing video games i didn't really start working till july <laughs> <laughs> that's not a business i know that's I know. just having fun i was just having a blast making i mean i wasn't bringing too much money in for the business but i was getting money home to my guys you know i wanted them to take money home so i moved mm-hmm. back in with my parents you know, I, I am very frugal when it comes to, you know, my personal spending. So I I just had to drop on my expenses to make sure that they took money home mm-hmm. during this time. And I think that really helped with their loyalty to, you know, understand that it's them first when it comes to like, we're not making a lot of money and I'll make my money later. So, well, it speaks volumes about you and, and your character, right? That's your taking care of them instead of taking care of yourself first. And I think that's what a great leader is going to do is they're going to make sure everybody under them gets taken care of so that everything can continue to push forward. And, you know, as long as you can pay your bills and and eat meagerly, like you're doing okay, right? You don't need the big toys and stuff. Like you can earn that down the road. Yeah. And that's where a lot of the books that I, that I started reading, that's kind of what like I started like running from where I started just, began reading you know I, I got a lot of the same philosophies as mr dave ramsey we read one of his books i think in the book club and and you know i i just switched my perspective i used to think i wanted all these things mm-hmm. the bigger house the bigger car and and you know just learning about the rat race and and you know the, these people who live their lives every day just trying to accommodate a lifestyle that isn't le- leading them to have any free time or happiness you know personally and so i just started chasing my free time and my personal happiness and self-development and then the money started coming in but i just didn't care about the money more i just started gave everybody a raise i started buying equipment heavily um mm-hmm. because the guy that we partnered with had a lot of projects like more than we'd ever done and so pretty much all the money i made last year I invested in preparation for this season um of work as, as you know we have we're seasonal workers so well, once it starts you know we're on season we're you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we got to be available to do these projects nationwide. So that's what we do. Okay. So initially, I mean, this is an awesome story, right? Like I screwed up, I made mistakes, I invested in learning in myself. This is all the stuff that this podcast is about, which, and I always appreciate your participation in the group, you know, talking about, Hey, yeah, I'm going to get the book and I'm going to read it and saying, Oh, that was a great episode. Like, You're very engaged with it. And so, but it it fit what you were doing, obviously, but there's a, it's working, right? Like you said, you had like 500 bucks in a a used van and I didn't see a used van outside when I pulled up and I definitely 
<laughs> didn't see five hundred dollars sitting in a bank account because you got a trailer full of tools and and, and a nice truck. I, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And I got a. I just bought a warehouse. I, I have another trailer coming in when I get home. Um, my machine's worth way more than my truck. I'm actually, like I said, I'm really frugal, so I actually won that truck in an auction for like <laughs> dirt cheap for what they're worth. And I'm like, I'm gonna make this thing buy me another one, <laughs> and not a new one either. I'm gonna wait for a six, seven year old one. You know? That's hey, that my F one fifty out there is not new. It was it's a 2012. Got it used with fifty thousand miles on it. That's pretty good. In a year and a half, I put thirty thousand miles on it. Man. So you know, it's a it's a work truck for sure. But it'll it'll buy me another one, and I'll buy go buy another twenty twenty five thousand dollar truck. I don't need an eighty thousand dollar F one fifty brand new. <laughs> yeah, not to tow around a, t- a tile saw, you know. <laughs> well, no, and then we'll get the we'll, okay. So I'm gonna draw, spend all the money on the new truck. The guys are gonna throw a bag of tile in the back, and they're not gonna make it over the bed, and it's gonna scratch the side. And then I'm going to be mad. I'll buy the used truck and not care. Yeah. And and that's a lot about like how I feel personally. Like when it comes to your vehicle, like you shouldn't be driving around flashy vehicles because it just gives you, to me, it gives you a bad image over your guys because you're working as a team and you don't want them to think that you're taking all the basket, you know, like home. So it really, like, I I just never want to have a nicer car than, you know, whoever I'm working with. Mm -hmm. And as long as it's working for the business, I don't think I'll ever overcompensate with a vehicle that I don't need it, you know, for, for power or luxury. I don't think I need any of that. Okay. I very humble. So, um, we reached out, we talked, um, you'd brought up that your business is as unique as you. And so everybody has a, everybody's a unique individual but you were saying to me, and I, and I loved where the conversation was going, and I, and I had to stop it, that yeah. <laughs> everybody's business is is a unique individual model. And so just because you're a commercial guy, um, we got we got Mario Fernandez in town as yeah. well right now. And like the way he's running his commercial stuff is not the way you're running your commercial stuff is not how I'm running my residential show. Yeah. And that doesn't, you know, everyone's going to have a different model, but we can all make it work. So... Where, what things have you found that were working for you, but then you were like, no, I got to tweak it. Like, where have you taken ideas and really like put that unique individual twist on them that fits you better? Well, as of last year, we were working for local, you know, local commercial contractors and we were just not doing too high. We weren't making a profit. You know, one of the first books I listened to with you guys was that Profit First for Contractors and learning about the contractor cycle and being stuck in that rut where you're not making enough money. But since I'm a subcontractor, I can't always charge more or uh, charge higher as I thought. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I actually started asking for what I wanted, and what would it, you know, and what would cover the business cost, what would cover my labor, what would cover a profit. And so I just dropped all my old contractors because they were working with prices from, you know, 2005, 2007, I feels like. They don't account for inflation. They didn't, you know, they don't account for, they'll give you one or two jobs for the the year. You know, it's like tossing you a bone, but you can't live off a bone. You gotta, you gotta take home food for everybody, Mm -hmm. you know? So that's, that's a lot of of my job is just finding them work, planning it out, making it as easy as possible for my guys. Cause you know, I, I get all the equipment. I find the jobs. They just bring their new pads in their pouch. So that's all they got to do for me. (laughs) That's, that's easy going, but I think that's the right thing, right? Like, if you're going to have employees, everything should be provided. They show up ready to go and everything's there waiting for them. Yeah. And then uh, some of the other books I've also read, like the dichotomy of leadership and extreme ownership have really led me to understand that I work for my team. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be sweeping, mm-hmm. I'll be vacuuming. I'll be like, what do you need help with? And mm-hmm. I teach those lessons and for my team's like, Hey, if you're going to move a table, sorry, I keep that. Ask for help. Like we're a team. We're not here to win by ourselves. Nobody wins by ourselves when we scratch the floor and have to come back. You know? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> get get somebody to help you drag the table. Or what do you need? Like, can I help you? And now my guys say like, stop me and ask me for help. That you know, and it's because it's a teamwork based, you know, project on all everything we do. So I, I just I just like that dynamic a lot. So you've taken in leadership lessons and then you've, you've brought them in and then you've set your guys up for success. And it's not like it's through repetition 
that it, it's, it's happening. It's not, it ha- didn't happen overnight, obviously. It probably took months of you being like, hey, I can help you. Hey, I can help you. Hey, I'm here to serve you. Yeah. And it's not that by serving your employees, you're not, don't think of it as, as being subservient, but by serving them, you're empowering them to not only make better decisions, but see that you want to lead by example, I'm assuming is, yeah. is like, that's what you're kind of shooting for. Yeah. Cause I don't want it to like working with my dad. It was just a stressful old time. He was just not, he was a great dad, but he's a bad boss. <laughs> and I think we've all dealt with those guys that are just stressed out, you know, pushing everybody and you know, he's a boss and he wasn't a leader. So I, I, I have a really laid back time, but I mean, we, my guys know I'm serious. They, they, they know that I expect high quality. They know I expect professionalism and, but I also give that to them. That's how I treat mm-hmm. them. That's how I talk to them. And when we're there, we're there to shine. When we get out of work, you can do whatever you want. You know, slept. But a lot of my guys, you know, they're they're pretty tame. They're older gentlemen, so they really don't. They're not very <laughs> partying or anything. They're just really boring old guys, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're, well, okay. So you're staying <clears throat> instead of getting a hotel, you got yourself an Airbnb, which is a little bit nicer of a setup, I'm assuming, and then it gives you access to a kitchen and stuff. And so. There's nothing like going on in here. They're they're quiet. They're hanging out. They're they're doing their thing. Yeah, just watching TV or playing on their phones. Um, the hotels here are generally super expensive. But the other benefit, even if an Airbnb costs you a little bit more money, is that everybody can cook their own meals and save money and take it home. You know, that's what mm-hmm. I want. I want people to take their money home, not to leave it in restaurants. And so, me personally, I love. I, I I'm me and my wife are pescatarians. I, we were octo over vegetarians, but. We really wanted to eat some salmon, you know. <laughs> so now we're pescatarian. So all my meals, I have to really know what I'm putting into them or getting. Um, so cooking is a big deal to me. So having the kitchen is very important. Okay. So I mean, there's there's the the business is being formed by more than just, and I, this goes for all of us, but it, it's being formed more than just I need to have money come in and money go out. So it's your lifestyle choices are influencing how it's run. Yeah, absolutely. And then your, um, I, what other unique things are you doing that separates you from a lot of the other contractors that you've seen run commercial stuff? And, and you know, like how are you separating yourself, selling yourself differently so that this business is truly you and your wife? Well, I mean, the I have a very strong drive to finish a job. I, I, I want to finish it, and I don't want to get any callbacks. I want the customer to leave us good emails, not like today. Uh, that wasn't any of our personal faults. But, you know, we want to sell the experience for our contractor, too, because we're representing them out in the field. So when you have a partner, like I'm the subcontractor, I provide the labor, and my partner finds the work, and he provides the funding to, to run those projects. And, and uh, without him, I don't think we would have – as much work as we, we would like. Uh, but consistency is, is more important to my, to my guys consistently mm-hmm. working. And cause that takes cons- home money consistently, but also, you know, this is premium work that we're doing. We're not doing, I, I I'm not trying to talk smack about like dollar general. We're not doing dollar generals like one a week. We're doing, you know, h- hundreds of thousands of square feet a month. It's, it's not exactly skyscrapers, but to me, it's a great accomplishment. Like from where I started, mm-hmm to where I'm at, we've, we've climbed mountains and there's only more to do. Like, I'm, I'm not, I'm just not sad. I mean, I'm sad. I'm very happy. I'm, I feel, you know, blessed for what I have, but it's the challenge of the project that drives me more than money. So, and we, we get offered bigger projects, more complicated. I was like, yes, that's what I want. You know, I, I jokingly <laughs> tell my contractors, I want to build skyscrapers in Dubai. That's what I want to do. But you don't just build skyscrapers in Dubai because you want to, you got to be able to back it up with equipment costs or whatever and the people that are trained and ready to do it and it's just it, it, it you can't just crawl to run to sprint it, it takes it takes time and money to do mm-hmm. all that well so what was it <clears throat> when you 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 talked about like you tried and, and and failed so what what was the difference between then and now what what did you what were you trying to do and, and you failed at was it just like low paying commercial work by being a sub and they were like yeah you can have like 10 cents a square foot for vct and you can go put in a thousand 
feet in you know a couple hours and you get a hundred bucks yeah that, that's kind of how it, how it went you know it started at like 35 cents sounded good 15 cents for the skimming and so you're running 60 cents I'm like yeah that sounds great and then you run through all the work and then you run through all your costs and you're like well i got like 10 percent left it's like that's not good you know and still got bills coming and and it was just the, that contractor cycle the rat race and and uh, the the times I failed, I was trying to own a business, not trying to, you know, live the lifestyle of an entrepreneur in a business, you know, because I like is a, it's the business is a reflection of how much effort and time and, you know, sacrifice from your family that you put into it. Because mm-hmm. it's, it's not just me alone. You know, I have to my wife makes a lot of sacrifices by taking care of our, our baby girl. And I, she used to work with us, too. So we would we put our money together and started this business. But, you know, she loved working with us. But. We need, you know, we definitely need her support. <laughs> well, I mean, look, if she's at home and she's running numbers and sending out invoices and things like that while raising your daughter, like that's still participating. And that takes a lot off of you because if you had to do all of that while you were on the road, I couldn't do it. I could barely do it. And I'm the one that has time to go home and do it. Like yeah. I, I could only imagine trying to keep track of it as I'm moving locations and driving 16 hours back to dallas yeah that's pretty much how it is a, a lot of my my guys when they ride with me they hate riding with me they bring headphones because i'll leave the radio off and i'll just sit there in silence <laughs> for hours and hours and i'm like i'm you guys you guys gotta understand i'm not just sitting here spaced out i am but i'm thinking about work the next project how i can improve like i always do the jobs in my head before i even get here <laughs> like i know what's going on if my my partner gets me the blueprints. I kind of have to show up. I was like, all right, there's the carpet. There's the other carpet in the, in the trailer. I can put that together. But all these stores are becoming more and more unique where I have to, you know, get here early, talk with the PMLs, uh, find out where, which areas they want us to fix. I can give them the expectations of what's, what's, what's actually going to happen because you can't always deliver, you know, a picture perfect product because of the, you know, the, the, the surrounding areas aren't just as good, you know. Mm-hmm. So you, I don't know where to go. I'll be honest. I like I, my brain stopped. Um, it's the end of the day for you. <laughs> it is. That's that's really the problem. It's just been a long day. I, I oh, too much math, and I didn't even do oh, math. Okay. Um, <laughs> math can be addicting, you know. <laughs> well, it, no, it was just a set of stairs, so it was just in and out and up and down. And, yeah, you can you get uh, brain fried every day, you know. Um, all right. So what steps did you take to, like you said that you started asking for more and you had to drop a bunch of contractors. So did you, were those contractors willing to give you more? And then it got to the point where they said no, and you had to keep replacing people or was it dead off? Like, no, you can't have that kind of money. And you immediately had to just go find new contractors to work for. Well, it, it puts a, a big like limit on your growth when you can't, make more money because I started making more money. I started hiring more people, started buying more equipment and it wasn't, you know, to take it all home. It was to grow the business for my guys to have, you know, I don't want them tearing out carpet by hand. Nobody wants to tear out carpet by hand, especially mm-hmm. glue down broad loom or tile or anything like that. You want to have the machinery, the equipment. Cause you know, yes, it may cost you a small fortune, but you're going to save your health long-term. You know, you're going to, you're going to take care of your back. You're going to take care of your knees and your hands. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, health costs long-term are a lot better if you, just invest in your equipment. But with the local contractors, I started dropping them because they're not there for you to grow. They're there to, to hit their profit margin, you know, and, and that's the thing about like, as a, as a younger millennial and my philosophy of like, I want to grow with a business. I don't want to just work under a massive contractor that forgets my name every time they call me and they have 10 different people that call me. And I think they're all the same person. They all have different names, but they have like the same phone number. Mm Mm-hmm. But it's just not like a personal relationship. So the the one I have right now is a small pop and son shop, just like mine. You know, his dad's the same age as my dad. I love talking to his dad. I feel like he gets a little jealous. I think he wants me to take I want to take his dad. <laughs> but I love the guy, and and they're just a small family business, and they also want to grow. And so we're actually about the same age, and everyone I've ever worked for has been, you know, 60, 70 years old, you know, trying to pay, like I said, 2005 rates. So Yeah. So you found somebody that wants that understands that it's going to take some money to make some money and they can't take everything and not feed you so that you can continue to improve and get better. And then you can both 
scale up and gain bigger projects. Yeah, because I want, I, I, like, you know, it all started, like, and there's so many reasons I do what I do, but the story goes back to we had just finished a big 80,000, 92,000 square foot project in Alabama. And they were, we were leading up to like, hey, look, there's a job coming up in Dallas. It might be good for you. It's going to be big. It's going to have a lot of complex stuff going on. I was like, that's exciting. That's what I want. You know, that's a big, that's a big, uh, you know, notch in your belt to accomplish those projects. And me personally, well, somebody else got it and I, I didn't get very, my feelings very hurt, but I got like a burning like feeling in my chest. <laughs> it wasn't like anger. It was, I wanted to be that guy. Mm-hmm. You know, who, who is this guy? And I don't, I don't know him personally, but I started imagining what it would take to be the top team, what it would take to be that guy that gets the job over me. And so I started working on developing myself, developing my crew, my team to become <laughs> that crew that you get called upon is the customer wants them to do it. So, you know, I, I think when I talked to their, one of their labor coordinators, they're like, you know, it's not a personal thing. We he had a big old conversation. He talked to me for 20 minutes straight. I didn't get like two words in. But he put this vision, this fantasy of like me running a 20-man show, grossing a million dollars a year, having a shop. I was like, yeah, I can believe, I can see myself doing that. Like I believed in it. And I saw mm-hmm. myself achieving it. And, you know, every day we get closer and closer. Um, as of now, I have 11 people working with me. I'm going to need 16 by the end of the summer. And hopefully we'll run into the twenties by next year. So but it's just you gotta find people Man. and bet them out. I can't even find one. <laughs> I don't know how you can get eleven. I, I don't know. It's just all word of mouth and reference and you know, Mr. Robert I met through Flooring Installers of America through another associate and uh, he he got stuck in a pickle where it was just him trying to do a, a massive project on his own. And I went in and helped him out. I had worked I I, st- I stayed awake. I drove home. So I'd been already awake for like 20 something hours. And then I stayed and I worked with the guy for 10 hours, almost 11 hours straight. And I just, it was so nice working with the guy. Like mm-hmm. He's just so humble, so kind, so hardworking, but he needed help. And, and I just, I did the project and we finished it and it was an, it was an awesome experience because it, it was hard. It was challenging. And my wife was very upset because I was supposed to get a sonogram the next, that morning. <laughs> and, I think I'd been away for 30 something hours. I was like, I'm going to sleep an hour and then we'll go to the sonogram. Yeah, but we you went. <laughs> okay. Sonogram. You got up. I'm surprised. <laughs> I didn't sleep. I just <laughs> sonogram. Then I was dead right after. Oh man. So, I mean, what's that been like? Okay. So, I mean, you're saying like, you know, it's, it's word of mouth and your guys are like, Oh, I, I know this guy or that guy. And, and they start bringing them in. And obviously you're building something that like, this is this is the conclusion I've come to, and so I'm I'm stuck because I can't get the people to even stay so that they can refer their friends and other people they know. But I think you need the business that everyone understands they're respected and treated well, right? They, they, yeah. It's a happy, good work environment, and then everyone, you know, they start people start hearing about it and they get attracted to it. But how do you do that when you're by yourself? Like who's going to, you can't spread you by like, I mean, you can, but it's, it's a lot harder when you're by yourself than when you have 11 guys out there, 16 guys out there all doing it. And they know, you know, this guy from that crew 10 years ago and this guy from that crew two years ago. And you know, Hey man, we're, we're slow right now. What do you got going on? And you can be, Oh dude, my guy's always, he pays well. He treats us nice. He he's, he's like, he'll get down and he'll move the table and and scrape the floor with you. (laughs) And, uh, you know, like that makes a huge difference. Yeah. I I think that's what helps a lot. Cause I, I I know when I'm there's my guys joke around, I don't do anything cause I drive the, the ride on, and then like I delegate the labor and then I help out where I'm needed. But now and nowadays there's, they're doing so well between all of them. Now there's six, seven of them working together to put the carpet down. And I was like, well, there's not even an extra trial. I can bring a trial, but then I'm just going to get in the way of that guy. And he wants to get better in practice. So mm-hmm. I'll do the, I, I do the medi- medial tax, like the, the tasks that nobody wants to do. Like last night I scraped glue for a little bit, like by hand, by like, or with a 14 scraper for like an hour and a half. Cause I knew I wasn't going to ask anybody to do that. I was going to feel like a complete jerk. Nobody had slept. I was like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so I did it. <laughs> and I, you know, and it's, that's how I think like, all right, I don't want them to do that shitty task. You know, I don't want them to go shovel poop if, if they don't have to, mm-hmm. I still got to do that, you know? And, you know, I, I try and break down the processes and make it 
teamwork based and it makes the whole job easier. Like everyone's working less now than ever before, but we're getting done faster and, and you know, we're turning a higher profit because when you're working together, it's just, mm-hmm. just steamroll through it. Well, when there's somebody that can actually step back and view the project as a whole and start moving pieces around and say, okay, hey, you're done over there. I need this to be done next. And it's not to say that they can't learn the flow and, and recognize it themselves, but they may see something a little bit differently and, and you're able to take that whole step back, remove yourself from it completely and be like, no, 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 it's going to be X, Y, and Z instead of, you know, they wanted to do W, Y, Z or something like that. Yeah, and there's definitely nights where you feel like like everything's smooth, rolling really smoothly and you've planned everything out, you processed it. And like, hey, look, you can't do that because in 15 minutes, he's going to be done, so he's going to need help moving that or doing this. So go do this for the next 14 minutes and be there in a minute. And like that's, <laughs> I'm not that micromanaging, but I do also like like the lessons of letting my guys fail. Because mm-hmm. um, one of my guys is like, hey, you got to teach me how to do it. It's like, I'm going to teach you one time. I'm going to let you mess it up. I'll correct it. And then you got to do it right you know, on the third attempt or whatever. Yeah. And it, cause if they don't learn that way, then they're just going to be sitting there with their hands. Like, what do I do next? So like, how does it look at the end of the day? <laughs> Every time it looks the same. Yeah. You know, that's what we want. No, I'm with you. You gotta, you gotta show them how to do it. You gotta let them do it and screw it up. And it, whether it's once, twice, three times that they screw it up, right. Depending on the task. And then you, you have to learn and everyone's going <sighs> to, as as craftsmen as as artisans right yeah. like we like to micromanage and we want to be like my way is the best way oh yeah well it turns out that there's like a million ways to skin a cat and so like there's probably a million ways to trowel out um patch and 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 feather in a you know skim coat something as yeah. long as at the end it, it's done yeah. we, we got to learn to step back and just let it happen yeah, and you got to be able to, because like my fixture guys, that because I have to have, you know, you have to have a fixture crew, you have to have your installer crew, but everybody together moves the fixtures. Because if you just make two guys move it, it's a lot. Because when we're doing, you know, I think the other day we did a thousand yards, but that's almost 9,000 square feet of sales floor of stuff that we have to take off and then put right back on. Mm-hmm. So my, my two younger guys, I mean, they're teaching me stuff all the time. And I tell them that all the time, like, if you find a way to give me the same result, then do it that way. You know? But if I see you messing something up, it's like, all right, look, I'll correct you. This is what I want. This is my expected result. Yes. And how you get about it is your way. Because I did grow up with a micromanager. And I just <laughs> never did things right. So I thought I wasn't learning. <laughs> you know? I thought I didn't know anything. But as you get older, I mean, I mean, as I got older, I'm not that old yet. But my guys teach me stuff all the time. And I tell them, hey, if you find a better way to do something, tell me. Because mm-hmm. I need to get better. And then I'll teach you what I learned in. So we just, it's a, it's a constant system that feeds itself of like constant, like, you know, improvement. Well, and there's just a, there's a difference in being open-minded and willing to learn, right? There's the stereotypical, um, like baby boomer, right? Like the guy that's 65 years old and still doing this, you're going to show up, you're going to work for him. He's going to tell you you're you're some profanity and to go profanity do this at your 18 you showed up for your first day and you have no idea what you're doing i yeah. like I, I actually you know what i went and did a i did a board repair for a guy yeah and um he was telling me that he was it was like his first summer out of high school and he went and started working for like a bricklayer or something like that so it's his very first morning and he shows up and the guy's like it takes a scoop of this, a scoop of this, and it like you know tells them how to mix the mud up or whatever they're going to be doing. And yeah, he's just the dude walks away and he's like standing there like I, I've never done this before. Yeah. Like what the heck? And so the dude starts cussing him up and down and telling him he's an idiot. Like I, that is not going to build a loyal employee, and that's not going to better the industry because. You know, in the end, I want my guys to know how to do everything. And that's why it's okay for them to spread out and do different things. Because they're not going to show, like, hey, look, you're not doing too hot on glue. Go practice a cut over there, you know. Or you're Mm -hmm. not doing too hot on the cuts. You know, go roll the glue or something. But it's just, you got to, like, how I go about things is, you know, I want everybody to learn everything so that you can jump in and fill the spot when it's needed. But it's, it's, it, it, they're making it harder on themselves. I mean, they post about it, the older gentlemen. They post about, oh, these young guys don't want to work. 
they don't want to work for somebody on their way out of the business who's just there to milk it and not help them grow. They want to grow. Like these younger guys want to develop themselves and grow. If you find the right one, they're out there. Don't yeah, the, out the, there. the people that want to learn and be the, will be passionate about this industry, they're out there. But we have to make it look sexy. I think Eduardo <laughs> is making this business look sexy to people. He's showing them that there's potential in it to make a good living. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and that's how I am about like when it comes to like the machismo culture is like, hey, look, I am, I, I can be, uh, you know, I do power, like I do weightlifting, I'm doing bodybuilding, I've done jujitsu and wrestling and, and that doesn't make me tougher than the next guy. I, it makes, I'm actually really polite. I'm courteous. And I'm, and I'm actually like sometimes my guys would joke around that I'm over submissive to the store contractors. Like those guys put food on our table. You got to be nice to them. <laughs> and I'm never mean to my guys. It's, you know, when I ask them to do something, you know, hey, let's do this together. Or, hey, would you mind if you're not busy doing this? You know, I don't tell them, hey, go do that right now. You know, mm-hmm. Maybe the, the labor guys that keep making the same mistake, but even them, I'll, I'll help them out. But it's just how they're running the show is, is really dependent. Like, my guys are laughing and joking the whole time while still delivering the same quality work. And they don't feel like overburdened with like a stress load because they have people to back them up. Well, when you get to have fun at work, it makes a big difference, right? Like everyone, oh man, I don't want to go. I don't want to do it. And I've been there lately. Like I've been in this funk. And so I'm not looking forward to going and installing another rectangle. Like woohoo, another one. Yay. (laughs) Real excited. And so like, and there's not anybody to like go and, and have fun with. And I remember when I was still working for the other company and I was working with John, um, it was, dude, we could go and we just cut up with each other all day because there was somebody fun to like hang out and talk with and go back and forth. Our kids are kind of close in age. It, you know, we never had to talk about the project. It just happened because we were able to get in a flow. And yeah. I know that like if he was actually available, if we could find a project to like put our schedules on together. Yeah. I haven't worked with him in two years. Give us 10 minutes. The project will be flying and we'll be we'll be cutting up and having a good time. And, you know, eight hours will go by like that and no worries, you know. And that makes a huge difference when you can go to work and it's just a good experience. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's what, like, like with with smoke. I mean, all my guys, you know, we laugh and joke at work and at the, at the end of the day, we got it done and it looks clean and good and, you know. When it comes to time to the to the to the store staff or whatever the PMLs, it's, you know, it's all professional. But you know, we start you know start joking on the way out. But we're we're not trying to hurt each other's feelings. We're mm-hmm. not trying to make because like, you're right. Like if you go and if someone makes you miserable at work, you don't want to go there. You know, you you Correct. you want to enjoy the people we work with. It just lightens the load of the work. And so, I I, I want to keep building on that culture of look, <laughs> we're serious, but we're not. You know. Take the work seriously, but don't take each other seriously, you know, but respect each other Mm -hmm. uh, as well. Um, So that's a big part of it. Well, I mean, you you have a different environment here, right? Like I can, I may have to take a truck ride with somebody at the end of the day, right? Like maybe we we got in a spat about something or like the the guy, you know, the employee screwed something up and you're you're like, you're just kind of cheesed about it. There might be a 30 minute, 45 minute truck drive, but like you can, you can split up at the end of the day and get away, right? Come back in the morning refreshed. Did you're sticking your guys in an Airbnb? They ain't got nowhere to go. And even if you were at a hotel, right? Like there's, yeah, you have individual rooms or maybe you have to share a room with somebody, but it, you can't have that because it's just, it, it's going to come back in the next day and then it's going to, it's going to fester there and then it's going to, you know, it can keep building and building. And so yeah. it sounds like you're trying to introduce a culture where, you know, hey, we're going to have all this fun. We're going to get the work done professionally and we need to respect each other no matter what so that we can be as productive as possible and still do what we need to do outside of work and, and like, you know, um, not survive with each other, but, you know, live with each other and experience each other, right? Yeah, and, and that, you know, I've explained it to my wife. I always joke around, and I always tell her, like, you know, we're still cavemen deep down. Like, we're we're this, we're a tribe, and we're hunting that carpet mammoth. 
<laughs> and and that's how I see my guys. They're like my family of, of spear throwers. And but I just got to find the. I got to go find the the. You know, did I say buffalo or mammoth? Yeah, mammoth. I got to go find the mammoth. I got to tell him, look, the mammoth's running that way. And we got to throw our spears in this direction. Mm-hmm. And that that's how I feel about it. Like I'm the I'm the group hunting tribal leader, and I'm hunting with experienced huntsmen. And that I'm always going on about the 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 that that we're like we're programmed like deep down in our heads to work together. Mm-hmm. Like nothing has ever been achieved in history by one person. No matter how great of like even the most successful people on the planet didn't do it alone. They were surrounded by people on a mission with them to accomplish, you know, greatness together. So I agree. I there's Rome wasn't built in a day and it wasn't built by one person. That's for sure. A lot of contractors. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And it's, you know, America wasn't the idea of, of one person. We say founding fathers for a reason. There's, there was multiple people bringing ideas to make this thing happen. So I think you're right in that in order to have that successful business, you, you have to allow other people to work with you. I'm not saying you have to go out and partner up with somebody. I'm not saying you need to have a, you know, shut down your LLC and open up a partnership with somebody, you, yeah. but you have to be open to working with people. I think, um, you know, the, the Jersey crew up there with, with Ken and man, who's, who's there. There's, there's Ken, there's, there's, uh, Donald, there's Carl, uh, Jim Segos, um, uh, Ken Ackerman, I think, man, I, I don't know all you guys up there. I don't work up there, but like they've made a really great relationship amongst themselves. They're all kind of spread out, um, and, and service different areas, right? Like there's a little bit of overlap, but not a lot, but when push comes to shove, and they're like, oh, dude, I'm running behind. Like, they'll jump in and, and go and help each other on the projects. And so it's not that, you know, I'm going to underbid you to get that project because I need it. It's, dude, go do what you need to do. But if you need a hand, call me. And that's, um, I, I, there needs to be more of that, right? There's, everyone's always, oh, all the hacks, they're underbidding me and they're doing this, they're doing that. Dude, go build a relationship with them. Try and teach them a better way to do it. Bring them in. Have them come and help you on a project when you're running a day or two behind. <laughs> but that, that's how it is. Every time I get excited, every time I see another a flooring crew, I'm like that guy's trailer says Talon Stone. I wonder if he needs help tearing out the shower walls. I can ride my machine up that wall. It's like, no, we're just <laughs> kidding. We're we're terrible at tile, but you know that's why we know that we're good at you know resilient and carpet broadened carpet you know carpet all the stuff that has to go in somebody has to do it mm-hmm. it's, it's not you know beautiful artwork much like some of the the master tile guys do in the mosaics but this is still something that society needs to be done and so when society has a problem there's money to be made you know society has dirty buildings they want new floors all right well i'll come in make it look nice put it back all together with good customer service and you know, problem solved and they're happy mm-hmm. at the end of the day. But, you know, not everybody's cut out to work by themselves. You know? <laughs> I think I get more frustrated when I'm working by myself than, than I do with, when I'm working with multiple people. I get it. And, and looks for that system works for some people. I, I totally understand that it's, it gets frustrating to be let down by employee after employee after employee. They quit on you. They go out on their own. But, it's I deep down I think it's part of the trade like we have to pass it on yeah. and if we don't then what are we doing like what what's the point in doing it if you're not going to pass it on to somebody exactly. otherwise it's gonna die and look at the state we're in now right like everyone's there, there's tons of work there's not enough people to go around to do it in my exactly. opinion and then it's it's so poor it, it pays so poorly. Because there's been bad training and bad business training for years and years and years that now we're we're in the situation where, okay, yes, the college agenda was pushed and, and kids don't want to like get involved, but who wants to get involved to be told they're going to make $35,000 a year and their knees are going to go out by the time they're 28 years old and they've been doing it for a decade, right? Like, wow, thanks, man. That's, that's real promising. Okay. So I don't blame them for wanting 100K out the door. But could you start them at 40 if you were getting some decent rates? 
Probably. Could you have them to a hundred within four or five years? Probably also. Yeah. But you got to get the business and the rates behind it to do it. And so we've got to build this thing and, and work with people and, and pass it on. And we have to do it correctly. Yeah. And it, it just, just takes, it takes time. I mean, uh, one of some of my guys, you know, they, they, their work ethic outshines their skill level in flooring. And, and when I talk to my installers, my, my main guys, I've been just, I, I want them to do just this installation. They help a little bit with the fixtures, but it's like, look, without those guys, you get no carpet done. <laughs> like, believe it or not, mm-hmm. it takes as much as a fixture crew as it takes an installation crew. And the customer sees the fixtures. They don't care about the carpet sometimes. Like you can do the best carpet job in the world, and it won't matter if a table's facing the wrong direction. <laughs> you know, they walk in and be. You know? uh, you, you, that's so funny because see, from a from the residential standpoint, right? All I ever get is they don't care that all the furniture's missing. As soon as the new floor starts going, in, oh my gosh, my home's so beautiful, it looks great. Like I constantly get positive feedback. Like it makes it really easy to go to work because you just get this positive feedback loop. Yeah. But in a commercial setting, right? Like they don't necessarily care that new carpet went in. They just want their cubicles back because they're not making money until it's functioning again. Exactly. Yeah. That's why it's all overnight retail work because those stores have to open up and keep making money. And I think I've read somewhere that it's like during a remodel of these big stores, their, their sales drops by a certain percentage. But after it's done, there it goes up, you know? And so it, it is an investment on the business to, to reinvest in itself. And to provide that work, you know, to local local crews and everything. Mm-hmm. So, um, what's been? You've invested in a bunch of equipment, and it's it obviously it doesn't happen overnight. You have a write on link, and you but you probably started with like a small like stripping machine, and then bought like a bigger one, and then the write on right. Like you you worked your way up to it. So what kind of stuff have you invested in that, you know, it's, it was little baby steps to get to where you're at now? Well, uh, I bought my dad's ride on, he sold it to me and I thought he loved me. So, but he made me buy his, uh, <laughs> his Bronco ride on. And I mean, we'll push that thing. The problem was that when you're trying to do fast overnight, massive areas and you got a 12 inch blade, you have a whole bunch of people standing around staring at you. So that didn't come into play because I was like, yeah, yeah, man, my, my Bronco kicks carpet butt. And my contractor partner was like, no, 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 you got to try these. And then he showed me the blade. And it was like 24 inches, 23 inches wide. And I was like, that'd get up a lot of carpet, wouldn't it? But it'd get stuck because obviously my Bronco gets stuck sometimes with its 12-inch blade. Mm-hmm. And he's like, look, when you're in Oklahoma, I'm going to get the manufacturer to bring one out. Try it out. I was like, all right, well, I want the smallest one because... I don't need a tank to drive around and carry everywhere because I got to travel. And so they brought me the uh, the Lightning, and it's about 2,200 pounds, and I drove it, and I just was flying. The carpet was just flying in every direction. And the concrete was coming out beautiful, and then the strips were coming out wide enough where you could just fold it twice and stack it on a pallet. And my guys were just like, one guy is like right behind me stacking and stacking, but it's taking out the carpet <laughs> twice as fast, and it, it just wasn't slowing down. I was like, I got to have this, man. And I told the, the the owner of the company when I when he came to pick it up, I was like, "It's always the test drive that gets you, man. Like you get you get on there, you get a taste of what it could be like, and you don't want to go back." <laughs> so, <laughs> so what is that a national then? What what no, is it? What brand a, is it? OEM Products uh, Inc. out of uh, Oklahoma City. Okay. Um, it the price was really good. Uh, it the, the power was good. Everything about it was just a a really good deal because we had we've had two Broncos. And we bought them, and I think we've run around about almost 29, or I don't know, pretty high, close to 30 with after everything. And he says, I'll sell it to you for 25.5, and you can pay me, you know, monthly, weekly, or monthly. And I was like, wow, I will take it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, it's twice as big, it's twice as bad, and it's like a trailer cheaper, you know, because I could buy a trailer for that much money. Yeah. So You still got the Bronco? It's broken down at home. I need to fix it. <laughs> then, then you're gonna get them both going. Go a little faster. I'm, I'm probably only gonna use it on smaller jobs because, like, if I have to drive over to Chicago, this one, and I'm doing a small project, I don't want to take the mm-hmm. tank. You know, that's what it really helped speed up our process because our fastest time just be five days. Then we narrowed it down to four days, and then we got to three and a half, and we recently just broke our three day, and that's you know that's over like twenty seven thousand square feet of carpet. And, and three nights, which 
it it it's it's actually only like sixteen hours of work to us, because you got ten people times sixteen. That's one hundred and sixty hours packed into three hours or three days. Sorry, and so now I can, you know, it's becoming more profitable because we've become more efficient and better at it, and we mm-hmm. have the machine to back it up. So that's so much stuff. Dude, what? Okay, twenty seven thousand square feet among ten people, an average Astoria. So. 2,700 square feet per person in three days? Yeah, in three days is what we're doing. So 900 square feet a day per person. Yeah, but, well, you know, it's everyone's going to say Man. it's broad loom, but it's it's the, the, I, it, the... It's wide and it goes down. Like, I get it. It's a big area. So once you can start, like, actually getting it down, it goes quickly, right? Yeah, yeah the, not... the installations become the easiest part of the job. It's the fixtures that are becoming more like the 60% of the work now because mm-hmm. I want them back... Because when you put them on right, it looks so good. Like, people are like, wow, that's running with the lines. And I was like, yeah, it is. <laughs> like, I stared at it for a while. And I, I, I'll run a laser soon. But it was like, that, those fixtures look really good. And that, that, that to me is a bigger winning point for the customer. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when you walk in and you can look at your environment and it's, it's nice, right? It's the little details, right? You could just throw the stuff back and be like, hey, I'm done. But then, what, you know. Are they going to have to move it themselves? Are they going to call you back to move it again? It's there's always a shortcut. You can you can skim somewhere, but if you you provide the full package, that's why you keep getting better and better work. Is because people are realizing, hey, this is a great end result. I I need to have Eduardo out to do the project. Like his guys are amazing. Yeah, and that's what it turned into. Because you know when I first I posted a video of me driving my my ride the Bronco and. I was doing a Target remodel and somebody messaged me, I don't know where, and they're like, hey, is that a Target? And I didn't know who it was. So I was like, I don't know, maybe, you know, it might be a Target. And they're like, well, I have a bunch of them. I was like, oh yeah, it's definitely a Target. So <laughs> like, I'll, and, and then, but at the same time, I was like developing myself to be like, I want to be the best. I want to be that guy that somebody calls. And so I went and he's like, how many can you do for me? I've got like 11 or 12. I was like, I can do five. Well, I ended up doing like 14 for him or 13. I have no idea. I lost track. I was just living in, <laughs> in these stores every night and some of them blend together some of them i walk in i was like have i been in here and but i just we knocked them all out and we had a and it just it was it was good and and now this year he gave us 100 percent of his stores you know out of all the ones that he won and bid he gave me 100 percent of the stores he's like well now i can take my crews and do more local work if you just focus on those i'm like well that's what I, all i like to do anyways so i'll do all your stores but we have a deadline and we have manufacturing delays much like everybody else. Yeah. And it's, it's stressful. Like tonight they don't want us to work. Like I didn't drive a thousand miles to sit in an Airbnb. You know? Well, yeah. I mean, you're, you're on a tight timeline and now it also, you know, you book an Airbnb for so many days, it may not be available the last day. Now you got to move out. You got to go get a hotel to stay an extra day to get the project done. You have something else lined up. So you got to call them and put, you got the same problems as everybody else, but you've got yeah, 10 guys that, now what do we do with yeah and then you know there's 36 more stores to visit this year and i was like all right well one day here is going to cost me all these other stores pushing them down again or i have to make mm-hmm. up for lost time so that's why we started pushing for the three days we came out successful from the three days and we're like all right we're gonna make up for lost time but i'm not gonna try and get them done faster i'm gonna get them done we'll finish a week early from what i want to get done but we're gonna take time off you know we're gonna mm-hmm. take our weekends off you know, if my guys need to go get their shots, I've flown them back. You know, one of my guys wanted to go work with his cousin this week. I was like, all right, go work with the cousin. Like, well, we can handle it without you here, but you're always welcome back. Yeah. And a lot of them do come back. And I was like, you can come and go when you want. And if, you know, if an opportunity arises, go chase your happiness, not more money. Because you're not going to be happy making more money. You're going you're gonna to be happy being happier, you know? <laughs> so. Well, yeah. Uh, look, I... Money doesn't buy you happiness. It can make solving your problems easier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can when you can throw some money at some problems, it makes it a lot easier to handle them. And and you sometimes you can just make things go away with money. <laughs> yeah. You know, there was there was a time when I, look, my AC unit went out last year. I had to drop six grand on a new one. There was a time I never would have been able to afford that. Yeah. Like, that's this funny. this career path, this business, this you know, this industry has provided very well for me. I've been very fortunate and you know, it was, Oh, 
Yeah, that's going to crud out on me. Oh, here. Call. Hey, come give me a new AC unit. Give me a bit on that. Oh, it's uh, here. Here's my card. Go get to, out of here. Yeah, just install it. My wife will open the door for you. I'll, I'll be working and exactly. so I can pay for it, right? Like I got to replenish that money now. But it, if you're if you're not enjoying coming, right? If if you're getting burnt out doing this and you have the opportunity to go do something else and you have a flexible enough schedule like it sounds great that your guys can go gallivant around and do something that's going to bring them happiness and then know like hey i didn't leave on bad terms i have an open door i can come back and get back in the swing of it and i can do it for a month two months whatever you know they need to do and then they can go do something that you know lets them de-stress a little bit again like being able to run a company that way or you know if you know for the residential guys right you're going to be in and out and in and out and in and out well if your guy really likes doing LVP and he doesn't do hardwood, don't put him on LVB, LVP projects, right? Like yeah. if you can put him on all hardwood projects and switch an apprentice or two around, if you're running multiple crews, like make it happen. Yeah. And that's, that's why it's been like, kind of like, that's what my, my next step is going from, Hey, I, I wanted a super crew and my super crew is going to die with me. Cause as soon as I'm done and they want to do whatever they want, the super crew no longer exists. It just, takes a lot to pull a team together you know tony stark pulled avengers together i'm not saying that but he pulled a lot of great people together that's mm-hmm. what he did and that's 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 i think what what it really takes to have these successful like, commercial businesses you got to pull a lot of good people together and then sometimes you got your your bad guys that you just kind of have to like weed them out and like hey look you know we, and you set those expectations you, you tell your guys like hey look i don't know who the other guys are but we're the best <laughs> <laughs> I've never met them, but in my head, we're going to be the best crew out there. And like, and I tell them, look, we got the corner sh- market share corner. Like we're, you know, and I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know how many stars out there exist, but I want them to know that to me, they're valuable. Mm-hmm. And I tell them that like, look, your work ethic reflects your value and you can make as much as you want. Like I, I one of my younger guys is like, if you want to make more money, work with me three years, get your own equipment and we'll start passing your own jobs. But this is what the expectation is. And the only way you make more money is like those sacrifices that we talked about, like sacrificing the weekend, sacrificing your mm-hmm. evenings with your family and putting that time back into the business because it's not going to pay off. You know, and you're just not going to get started and money's going to start rolling in. You're going to have a lot of nights where you're crying in a parking lot because you have no money, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, oh, yeah, there's it, it can be tough. I But look, something different again, right? Like. You don't have a young kid that you're you're cursing up and down because he can't mix bud properly for you. Like you're you're telling him you want more money. Here's the steps you need to do to get there, and yeah. that's a, way different than a lot of guys, right? It's they they see the invoice and they're uh, amazed at the big number at the bottom. Yeah, and then they're pissed off that they don't get the big number. <laughs> but they don't realize all the expenses I and know. equipment and payroll taxes and insurance and, and travel they, fees. Yeah. And so then they don't have a big check. Plus they're like, well, I can't charge that much. Like I have to charge less. And then the next guy on them runs out and charges less. And like, look, it's not hard to figure out how we got to where we're at. Yeah. But I, I think if we start actually teaching how to do the trade along with how to run a successful business, it can it's it will dynamically change the next 10 years of this industry and you will only see it become more empowered and better exactly i I don't want my guys to work for me forever and i think some of them know that like look i'm not going to do this for 20 years i'm going to do this for i don't know another nine years because i'm going to invest i want to do other things i'm not going to get out of the flooring trade because it's what i know and what i love so i'm probably consult train people i'll probably go out project manage but I need to make my money another way mm-hmm. so that they have their opportunity to make money. Cause you can't just sit on the throne the rest of your life. You gotta, you, it's gotta be a more of a political system. You gotta vote your leader in, I think. And so I, I'm going to do my best with my team for the next, you know, nine years or, you know, if they, and like I mentioned earlier, if they want to head out, they can head out and start their own cruise, but I'm going to tell them how to do it right. Because my end goal is for a better industry because mm-hmm. a better industry leads to less, you know, less stressful workloads where, you know, you're not getting slammed down with, hey, look, you got to finish 100,000 square feet this month. I was like, whoa. Like, I don't know if I can do it, you know? Yeah. 
you can't keep pushing for time and high quality. And that's that's where it's we're expensive. at, right? That's where everyone... You have to produce X that's unre- unrealistic for not realistic pay. It's it's ridiculous. No one... like You can't keep this system up and something has to change. And that's why we're here. This... If you're listening to this, you're willing to help be the change in that the industry needs and that's we we need to do it moving forward it, it's going to start with the relationships you build around you and I, like i said you know i think a lot of us need to get more of what ken and all those guys have going on we if you're i'm still not super plugged in although i'm, I'm working on it i'm starting to talk to more guys but i also started an arizona flooring installers page and so like i think that we're up to like 70 members now and so I'm starting to try and interact with that more and get something going. There's guys saying, hey, you know, if you're not busy, let me know. Like, I need help. It's amazing. But it gives you a way to connect and go out there, meet people, influence them, and change them, right? And so when the guys at the bottom change, because the manufacturers aren't going to do it. Look, the manufacturer's got a great system right now. If the floor is installed poorly and it fails, it has to get replaced. Stockholders love selling more material and making more money. Okay. So that system's broken and it ain't going to change from the manufacturers, in my opinion. The retailers have a great system because they're marking up your labor. And while they should, look, they have responsibilities to take on their side. I get it. Okay. Yeah. Are they paying fairly? Could some retailers charge more than what they think in their areas and pay you more? Probably. But we have to stop going in and saying, what are your rates? Why are you, as a guy running a business, asking them what they pay you? Go tell them what you will accept for pay. And then provide the quality of work that will allow you to be paid that. And then teach your help that they are worth that or more and that they can do the same thing. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And I think that was a few years ago when I, I went through an inspection consulting training course in Georgia that I really saw that they have 99 ways to blame the installer. And that scared the hell out of me because I'm an installer. And I was like, wow. <laughs> And then you th- and then it starts flashing back in your head all the things you did wrong in your life. Like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> like It could come back and haunt me. And so I was like, I don't want that to happen to me anymore. So I definitely um, started doing better. I started reading the buckets, started putting the trials the right way, starting area, you know, took off the fans from the glue if it doesn't require it. I started rolling with the 100-pound roll. I started doing everything as mm-hmm. right as I possibly could. And they will definitely still always find a way to try and blame us. And, you know, I just minimize. I, t- I document. I take photos. I, you know, I screenshot conversations if I have to because I've run into an issue just last year with those local contractors where they say, no, 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 I told you. In that meeting that we wanted herringbone, I was like, well, these blueprints, this screenshot of a conversation, and these blueprints you emailed me, don't say that. And so, yeah, that guy, I got him. I mean, but he was trying to throw me under the bus. Yeah. Just trying, you know, and I wasn't making any money at the time. I think I'd do like a $2,700 job and it cost me $2,900. <laughs> you know, it was just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just bleeding money during that time. And for them to come back and try and throw me under the bus was very upsetting. So, I learned quickly to spot those kind of people. They're not here to help me win. And when I win, you're going to win. Mm-hmm. And if mm-hmm. I lose, you know, you're not winning. <laughs> like, so I got to win and you got to win. Correct. Find so, the right partners yeah. and dot your I's and cross your T's. There's, it's, yeah. there's rules and regulations for a reason. Look, uh, no project's ever going to go perfect, right? Yeah. You're never going to hit all the check boxes, but you can mitigate responsibility and that's all we're trying to do right if it says that you need to run the moisture test run the moisture test see that it's within spec if you need to install it with the quarter inch v-notch trowel install it with the court like do everything you can right okay it's going to tell you you need a quarter inch expansion well maybe one of them's three sixteenths oh my goodness like come on (laughs) right like do your best to hit them and you're most likely you're going to be okay. You're going to be better than the guy that's not hitting as many boxes, right? If you can hit nine out of 10 and they're hitting three, okay, you have way less chance of eating a job than somebody else. So 
Take pride in what you do. Do it the right way. Build the right team. Partner with the right people that want to watch you grow as they yeah. grow. And I, I think you're going to get to where you want to go. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, like my current partner, he knows that I'm not taking my honey, my money. I was going to say honey, my, my money and trying to buy a sports car. He knows I'm trying to buy another machine, another trailer, another van mm-hmm. so that I can provide better services to him. So it's an investment on his part to pay me a premium over his regular cruise because I, I have the same vision as him. Like we will sit there and we'll talk and we're like, look, if you find somebody, you got to tell them what you want to do. You got to tell them what you want to accomplish. Mm-hmm. Cause if you're just out there with secrets, they're never going to want to help you. And people want to help each other. I want to help him. He wants to help me. And, and you know, and like we have that dream of growing a business that can compete with some of the largest contractors in the company. I'm like, I want to be your guy cause I'm young right now and I am capable and I, I, st- I still want to keep training. I still want to do my CFIs. I still need to go through more inspection courses. I want to learn everything about there's to do about flooring. Am I going to do it? For example, I learned how to flash cove. I'm not good at it. I'm not going to make a living <laughs> off it, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I can do it. It's just I'm not going to make money off of it. It takes practice, right? But yeah. if you're not, it goes back to finding the, the projects that you're going to be most profitable at. If, if you're not going to invest the time to do it, then don't take those projects, right? Like if yeah. you're you're apparently really good at throwing out broadloom carpet and having your guys do it, right? Like if that's what's working for you and that's what makes you money, find those projects. Yeah. It just makes sense. You have to look at be able to look at the numbers and figure out what's working for you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, making those investments cuz I'm not heavily invested in a tile. I'm heavily invested into retail commercial work in LVT or Broadloom. Mm-hmm. Like I can't just get up and start pumping out tens of thousands of square feet of ceramic tile. It would take more money than I'd make. So it's just got to invest in the right, in the right fields and specialize, you know? Mm-hmm. So. Well, once again, I, the business I mean, here, we can come full circle. So the business is as unique as you, you yeah. find a set of skills that you're good at. You find a set of skills that your guys are good at and you put them together and you make it happen. Yeah. And then, you're going to add little flares here or there of how you can uh, make your business stand out by how you sell your value, right? Everyone's going to have a different value proposition. And so that's it. You know, everybody is going to have their own unique thing. Um, I got to stop us. This is fun, but I got to stop us. I know. Um, you got to give a home. And, well, you got to probably get going here soon too. So, um, where can people reach out to you and, and learn how to be a pescatarian or how you got your start <laughs> or learn about stoicism or, you know, bodybuilding and weightlifting? How, how do they find you? I mean, I, like, I'm not really, I don't, since I don't advertise, I'm not for hire. It's just, just got to add me on Facebook at Eduardo Felipe Martinez. And uh, I'll, I'll message you back. You can ask me questions. And if I don't know, I'll find somebody that knows, you know, and I'll be, um, I'm always here. You want someone needs some help if I'm not busy, you know, <laughs> no, no TikTok, no Instagram, no website. Oh man. I, do, I don't advertise. I just, I love what I have and okay. I don't, and I, I try and keep it to myself. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so. All right. Sounds good, sir. Thank you for your time. Thanks. It was great coming out and, and meeting you. Thanks. And, uh, I, you're apparently going to be back some more, so we'll hang out again. Yes, sir. All right. That's all the time we have for this week. To keep the conversation going, head on over to the Floor Academy Facebook group. Be sure to subscribe so you can hear each and every episode. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and most major podcast directories. Don't forget to leave a review and let us know what you think about the show. If you would like to be a guest, have questions or feedback, you can email us at FloorAcademyPodcast at gmail.com. You can help support the show by becoming a patron over at www.patreon.com slash floor academy remember to learn well you earn